don't quit. Easier said than done when life throws punch after punch and leaves you wanting to run. Throwing the towel seems like a nice dream and the white flag seems very likely. Close your eyes and let it all go. Abandon your post oh so politely. But then you hear no. To the very end you will go. For I am with you in the cold. I do not abandon one of my own. I said I am with you always. So keep your head up in the dog days. Whether it's good times or the low ones. It all works towards your promotion. Hear this address as a father to his children. The voice of God is your assistant. This is the way, walk ye in it. There's no quitting for you Christians. Look up to where your help is. Whenever you're feeling helpless, hear my voice call you to ascend. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. You win in the end. Go on, turn to your neighbor and say, don't quit. Well, today, uh, actually all weekend has been um, a treat. We've had our good friend, uh, the doctor, one of the doctors of Bethel Church who comes in and uh, gives us some medicine, um, at least yearly. Um, and I'm going to introduce him in a moment, but before we do, um, just give a, a little bit more context to the Bethel One um, conference and um, welcome everybody at Bethel Sunrise that is joining us live stream right now and those that are joining as well online. Um, we uh, want to, to bring Dr. Greg over to Bethel Sunrise this morning and um, as well as tonight he's going to be preaching. If you like this morning his life message he'll be preaching tonight which uh, really was one of the first messages I heard him speak over 12 years ago, and he's been coming back every year since. And um, But back to the Bethel One Conference, uh, 22 years ago uh, at Bethel Brentwood in uh, just outside Nashville, Tennessee, um, we were sent uh, from there to Arizona to help plant a church in North Scottsdale. And then we came down here over 15 years ago to start Bethel uh, Church here in Chandler. And we hadn't been back on a Sunday morning since then. And uh, it was there at Bethel that um, I uh, got married to my lovely wife, Julie. It was there at Bethel that I was ordained. It was there at Bethel right before we came out here that uh, Isabella... Um, who led worship, one of the ones leading worship today, who was dedicated. And, um, and then 22 years later, to be there for the conference, Julie to be one of the keynote speakers at the conference. She was amazing. Had my daughter leading worship there and me able to, you know, participate and introduce her. It was amazing, right? And all of that because God is faithful. And because God is faithful, I was able to be, we were able to be faithful and not quitting. And if you quit, you lose so much. And praise God, even when we quit, God doesn't quit. Amen? But if you quit on relationships, you don't have those stories. And God wants you to have those stories. He wants you to be able to look back at your life and see relationships that will go into eternity because relationships are all that you're going to take into eternity. Your relationship with God and the relation with those that are other brothers and sisters in Christ, all other, everything else is left behind. And so are you putting you know, the, the commitment and the effort into what matters in life. And if you quit, you lose all that. You lose it all. And so there's moments where other people quit on you, but you have to not quit on them. And if you do, they'll come back to their senses. The grace of God will come back and it can be reestablished. And so there are many opportunities to quit. There are many opportunities in life to quit, but don't quit because it's worth it. Amen? 
Okay, so before Dr. Greg comes, on your seat, uh, on your seats over Bethel Sunrise, you have an invite card to Easter weekend. We have two Good Friday services, our Messianic service on Saturday, four services on Sunday morning. As well, God has opened the door for us to go to uh, Perryville um, Female Prison to do an Easter service there. It's the largest female prison in the west of the Mississippi, and God has opened the door for us to take Easter to them. Over 1,200 will be there for that service. So we're so honored and excited to bring the gospel. Uh, and I promise you, the gospel will be preached on Easter. It will be, it will be clear. It will be simple. We'll be talking about the resurrection, and people will get saved. People are going to get saved. Amen? And so I'm asking you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. Do you know, uh, some of you have been afraid to invite your neighbors or friends to church because you think they may say no. And they might. But the chances of them saying yes to an Easter service go way up. Okay? In fact, there's more chance of them saying yes if asked, this is a fact, more people will say yes to come to an Easter service that you invite than will say no. So if there was ever a time to step out and invite somebody, it's for Easter. Amen? And uh, this, this advertisement uh, will go right along with the one that your friends and neighbors see on the 202 as it's on the billboard right up here. So they're going to go, oh, I saw that, okay? And so you can invite them and follow up with that, amen? Will you do that? Will you invite somebody to church, amen? <laughs> Praise God. Okay, same over there, Pethel Sunrise. Will you invite somebody to church, amen? Let's fill this place up. We got extra chairs we're gonna bring in for those services, but uh, it's gonna be amazing. But today, right now, we have the privilege of having an amazing friend Again, a doctor to our, to our church. He spent all day yesterday ministering at our Messianic service as well as an intensive at our Every Nation Leadership Institute, which was amazing. And, um, and so he's here this morning and then tonight. Um, good friends, Dr. Greg and Debbie, uh, we hang out together. They stay with us. We stay with them in Vancouver and... Um, it's so rich to see what God has done um, in our families and our lives and, and, and to be together. He preaches around the world. He's an amazing um, theologian. Uh, teaches at our seminary. In fact, I'll tell you just one funny story. In seminary, I was taking his course. And so I was reading the assigned reading. And I took the book, and I, I, uh, it was a digital book that I put into a program that it became an audio book for me. And then I sped it up in speed. And so it's, it's you know, reading the, the book, the book's being, you know, read to me. And I'm, I'm listening to it. I'm like, oh, this is where Dr. Greg got all his information from. Not knowing that it was the book he wrote. <laughs> and, and so finally I came to the census because all the stories, I'm like, wait a second, that's, that's, he's, that's, I know that story. He's protecting their name, but I know that, that story, right? It's him. And, and uh, so give it up. Stand to your feet over there at Bethel Sunrise as well. Give it up for Dr. Greg Mitchell as he comes. Thank you so much. I always feel better about myself after Pastor Mike introduces me. <clears throat> Not that any of it was true, but it feels very good inside. Just want to say hello to, uh, to Bethel Sunrise. Really glad that you're able to, uh, to join into this service. I trust that God's going to meet us in this time. Um, I thought it'd be good to just maybe introduce my family. If you guys haven't seen, we have 10 kids. And uh, in the last three or four years, four of them have got married. So our family just keeps growing. And uh, I wish I could tell you stories about every one of them because they mean so much to me. Uh, before we jump into the word, I also just want to acknowledge, say thank you so much to uh, Pastors Mike and Julie for your friendship, for your leadership, 
and uh, for the way that you inspire Debbie and I personally and uh, serve in the kingdom of God. It really is a remarkable thing, and your team is, uh, is absolutely incredible as well. We're going to be continuing today uh, on a series um, on Joseph, and I thought that maybe a way to begin this is to talk about what the Christian journey is about. In Philippians chapter 2, there is a description of what our journey in Christ is like, and it's about death and resurrection. You know, sometimes we can think that the journey that God has us on is kind of a journey that is a straight line upwards, and that if ever your life dips down a bit, it's because there's been a lack of faith in your life or there's sin in your life, and you should really pick up the pace, and, and there's this thought that maybe the way that Jesus wants me to grow is grow in this vertical, or sorry, linear path of just going upwards. And it's, it's, not, it's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is always about death and resurrection. And so we're really grateful for the, for the stories of, of healing and miracles, lives changed. That's what the gospel is all about. But the journey there is often surprising. This really came to light for Debbie and I when we had an opportunity a few years ago to go to Israel. And our, the first night that we were there, our guide, who's one of the most remarkable theologians and Christians I've ever met, his name is Arye, he explained to us how the geography of Israel describes this resurrection path of, of, uh, of, how, we, of how we follow Christ. And he says that when the people of Israel started uh, before they came into the Promised Land, they were all camped on Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is on the other side of the Jordan River, and it's almost level with Jerusalem. But they, they started there, and then they traveled down to the Jordan River to right where the Dead Sea is. So it's the lowest place on earth is where they had to travel through in their journey into the Promised Land. And so they crossed the Jordan, and this was their baptism experience. So they get baptized, become the people of God, they, uh, and then the first city that they encounter is Jericho. And Jericho was paradise at that time. So you've just become a Christian in a sense, and the first thing that you get hit with is the temptations of the world. And so the first thing that God commands them to do is to destroy those worldly temptations in order to follow him. And so they conquer Jericho, and then they start climbing up the Mount of Olives. Now, if you've ever overcome anything in your life, and you're feeling quite victorious, and you're starting to climb up and do the plans and purposes of God, pride can get into your heart. And so the story of the Good Samaritan takes place on that journey going up the Mount of Olives, which is just about to get to, uh, to Jerusalem. And what delivers us from that pride is loving your neighbor, the Good Samaritan. And we remember that it's not about us. And so we, we climb up. We're on the Mount of Olives. Again, that's just right across from Jerusalem. And there's one more valley that remains. And it's called the Kidron Valley. And it's described as the Valley of Leadership. And uh, this is where betrayal occurs. And so we know this from David when Absalom tried to usurp his throne. He fled through the Kidron Valley. We know that when Jesus was tempted sorry, when Judas uh, betrayed Jesus, rather, he went through the Kidron Valley. And so there is this awkward part of the Christian journey that's about a valley. It's about going down, not going up. And somehow we need to be able to factor this in to our Christian experience. Again, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel guilty if I'm going down. Something's bad, bad is happening. Well, it's part of God's design. So, you know, when have you been in a valley of betrayal? When have you been in a Kidron Valley where you thought that you were serving Jesus and loving others and then things went sideways and you end up getting accused or misunderstood or betrayed in some kind of way? And we want to be able to ask the question, how is this a critical part of our journey? Well, we discover that answer through looking at Joseph's life. Joseph uh, had two Kidron Valleys at least. One of them is when he was younger, his brothers, he, I mean, he, it was not a great move, but he goes in front of his brothers and says, hey, I've got great news. I'm going to be ruling all of you. 
And that doesn't go over well with siblings. And so they were jealous, really upset with him. They throw him into a pit. That's a downward movement. So they throw him into a pit. God delivers him out of that pit, takes him to Egypt. Um, and then he's serving in a place as a slave in, uh, for a man named Potiphar. His wife uh, tries to seduce him. He doesn't give in to that temptation. But she becomes insulted by that, accuses him of violating her, and now he gets thrown again into a pit, a prison, uh, not deserving to be there. During that time, he gets put in charge of the entire prison because there's this grace upon his life for leadership. Uh, while he's in there, there are two servants of Pharaoh who are also in prison. Both of them have dreams, a cupbearer and a baker. The uh, Joseph interprets their dreams. The cupbearer, really bad news, he ends up dying. Uh, sorry, the baker ends up dying. But the cupbearer says the dream is that he's going to be reinstated to be um, in Pharaoh's court. That happens. He's serving Pharaoh, but he forgets about Joseph. Joseph says, don't forget when you get reinstated. Don't forget me. Well, he did. And so for two years longer, he's in prison. And then finally, Pharaoh has a dream doesn't know how to interpret it. And then the cupbearer remembers, oh yeah, there was this guy in prison who knows how to interpret dreams. And so then they bring up, they tidy up Joseph, bring him out of the prison, stands before Pharaoh, uh, interprets the dream, and, you know, super happy ending. He becomes second in command only to Pharaoh and really rules Egypt. It's an incredible story. Now, what we then need to look at this morning is how is this Kidron Valley, this pit that Joseph was in, this experience, how did this prepare him for leadership? Why was this an essential part of his journey moving into the plans and purposes of God? Going down, not going up. Well, there are three things that he did in that time that help explain the significance of being in a Kidron Valley. And let's look at all three of those now. So first of all, uh, he served his captors. So you can imagine you're thrown into prison. You don't deserve to be there. And uh, the warden is keeping you in prison. And this is what said in Genesis 40, verse 22. The warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. So it looks like a better promotion, really. It's just the warden being lazy, just taking advantage of one of the prisoners and says, you do the work for me. I don't want to do the work. And so here you have Joseph serving those who, have, who are held, holding him captive. This is a remarkable attitude. Why is it important that we would have experiences in our life that are unfair? Why does God do that to us? We're nice people. If you call yourself a Christian, you're trying to follow Jesus. And then he sends us into these pits where often we don't deserve to be there. It doesn't make any sense. So why is this important? Well, if God is preparing us for leadership, which, by the way, means every one of us in this room. It's not just the people who hold a microphone or who stand in front of people. That's not true at all. Anybody who has influence, anybody who has decided to love someone other than themselves is a leader. And so uh, why then, if God wants to uh, prepare us for leadership, would he send us into these places of betrayal? Because the leaders, the main danger of a leader is pride. It's the main danger. It's the main problem that we see in leadership. One of the things, I don't know if you notice, I try not to pay too much attention because I find it so discouraging. But um, in the last number of years, it's been shocking how many famous evangelical leaders have fallen. And somebody just sent me a a text um, uh, two days ago about another leader who was just very, very significant And he now has allegations against him. We don't know whether they're true. But it's like, oh, man. And I'm I'm so struck by the fact that as God gives us responsibility, pride can come into our hearts. And we can assume that it's because of us 
that, he's, that we've been promoted. And he looks at us, he goes, wow, that's a good one. He's a really, really good guy, good woman. Wow, I'm going to lift him up and make him great because there's not many like him. When I made him, he was super special, and so I need to honor that, you know. Um, this is what pride is. Pride says that uh, in Luke 18.9, it describes a man who was confident in his own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. That what pride is, is a kind of superiority. And it says, I have certain gifting or ability or calling that nobody else has, and I look down on everybody else and consider myself to be special. So how does God deliver us from pride in order to move us in to our destiny? Through injustice. Injustice is the most efficient way for God to kill our pride. Injustice is. I don't think I'll get an amen on that. I don't think I will. Call it a hunch. Um, but this is how God delivers us. What's our issue? Is pride. So we begin to, you know, believe something about ourselves, and then something comes along to, uh, uh, that insults us. And in that moment, we have a powerful decision to make. Will I defend my pride or will I let this insult crucify my pride? You know, I hear people so much talking about their, uh, and I mean, it's, it's, it's biblical in lots of ways, but their personal dignity and pride and, um, you know, I'm becoming all that God has made me to be and how dare you um, misunderstand me or judge me. And for sure, we're made in the image of God. And for sure, we have infinite value. But pride's not about that. And God is trying to remove that which would ultimately kill us if we moved into any more kind of responsibility. In Luke 6.35, it says this, Love your enemies. Do good to them. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. Wow. Love your enemies. There was a, um, there was a woman, and I can't go into details to, uh, to just um, um, protect her. But it was just an incredibly painful time um, in my life where I was being accused of things that I, I'm, I know I didn't do. And I remember I was crying out to God and saying, God, this is not fair. This is unjust. And I asked, you know, I, I find some psalm that supports my attitude. And I just asked that you would, you know, crucify my enemies and vindicate me because I'm a super great guy. And, uh, and then I hear God say to me, um, uh, she was doing you a favor. I'm not sure it's the kind of favor I was looking for, but uh, he says, I have been trying to kill pride in your life for years, and I sent her to help you. And I remember in that moment going, oh, God, this is absolutely true. Uh, when I was younger, I never do this anymore, just for the record, because it's being recorded. But... Uh, <laughs> But when I was younger, long ago, I used to speed a lot. And, uh, and I, I remember, um, well, I remember my, uh, the police, you know, misunderstanding my talent and ability behind the wheel and, uh, <laughs> and removing my license for three months. God bless them. It's, on, it's recorded. And... Um, I remember this one time that I got pulled over, and there were many. I remember this one particular time that um, uh, I just felt so, it was so unjust. And, uh, you know, I was barely going with the speed limit or something like that, and, and I was just so upset. And then I thought, okay, let's say that, let's pretend for a minute that that was unjust. You were speeding a hundred times 
before that and you didn't get caught. But now the one time you get caught, you think it was you weren't totally deserving of the ticket. And it's like, you just didn't catch me all the other times. That's the only difference between now and any other moment. But my pride, right? When you feel something, that something unjust is done to you, your pride wells up and it gets exposed. And it's in that moment that a decision can be made, whether to crucify what you now see or whether to befriend it. And God invites us to crucify our pride to, by loving our enemies and by serving our captors. That's point number one of what we see in this valley. Point number two is to interpret dreams. During this time that Joseph is in prison, um, this cupbearer and baker come to him and say, hey, we've had these dreams. You hear that you can interpret dreams. Would you help us? And he says, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll help interpret your dreams. Now, what an interesting thing to do. Here is a man who has a call upon his life. God has promised that he's going to do, uh, he's going to do great things. And what does he give his attention to is not the fulfillment of his own dreams, but the interpretation of other people's dreams. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? You know, think about your, uh, where you might work. What if the way to promotion is not through you stepping on others to climb the ladder to success, but making others great? What if that was the way to move in to what God has called you into? One of the things that most impresses me, and there's lots, but that most impresses me about pastors Mike and Julie is they're always, you know, I get to sit in the living room and hear them talk in private. And what they're always talking about is how to promote you, not them. It's remarkable to me. They never talk about self-promotion. They only talk about promoting others. That's the mark of a great leader. So what then is this about? What is the second danger? If the first danger was pride and injustice helps deliver us from that, what is the danger that we see here? And it's selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is a huge problem in not just secular leadership, but Christian leadership. That somehow we're going to make a name for ourselves and we're going to be, we're going to be you know, kind of the man of God or whatever that's going to be uh, respected. And so what we find then is that the antidote to selfish ambition is to make others great. Would you let that be your job description? What if the purpose in your life is not to fulfill your destiny? What if that's God's problem? And your problem is to actually make others great. That's freedom. That's freedom. Try to be ambitious. It's exhausting. You're going to have to step on other people. You're going to have to disregard them, promote yourself. It's a horrible way to live that does little to reflect the beauty and splendor of God. This is what we find in Jesus in Mark 6, 45. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why did Jesus come to earth? It wasn't to make himself great. It was to honor his Father and to love you and I. And that is overwhelming. And then what does God do? Gives him the name that is above every name. That's God's responsibility. My responsibility is to die to my selfish ambition. And I do that by making other people great. Um, a number of years ago, Debbie and I were kind of following... Uh, somebody who we really appreciate, his name was John Wimber, and he was the, kind of the founder of the Vineyard Movement. There was not, maybe you've heard of Vineyard Churches, if you've been in Christian circles for a while. And it was powerful. It was, uh, yeah, it was what I consider to be very robust theology, but an experience of the power and presence of God. And I had just not seen anything like that before. And so Debbie and I were kind of little groupies, and we'd go over and follow him around. And he would tell stories. And I remember one of the stories that he told is that there was a woman um, 
that he knew that had uh, multiple sclerosis. And my dad died of MS when I was a teenager. And so he kind of piqued my interest telling this story. And he says this woman had an amazing healing ministry. She healed all kinds of people. But what her specialty was, was healing people who had MS. Isn't that fascinating? Here's a woman who's suffering from MS, not healed, making other people, uh, through the power of God, of course, other people are getting healed, and she's not. Why does God do that? Why does God, as Paul says, uh, have, keep a, a, a thorn in our flesh? I think we need these things to crucify selfish ambition and to make it about glorifying his name and not our own. And so we can resent our weaknesses or we can receive them with great gratitude that God is keeping us humble so as not to disqualify us from ministry, but to keep us able to serve him and others. In, uh, in business literature, I read it now and then. I find it somewhat helpful. The Bible's more helpful, but it's sometimes helpful. One of the things that they recommend if you're in business, and that if your business is doing well, then you say you use we language. You say, well, it was because of our team and we were able. And then if it's not going well, you use me language. When it's not going well, you say it's my responsibility. When it's going well, you say it's, it's, it's all that they did. That's a mature leader. Somebody who's interested in selfish ambition would reverse that, won't they? Wouldn't they? If it's not going bad, they go, well, it's this team. I don't know. I would have done it this way, but anyways, I'm a team player. <clears throat> There's something liberating, uh, particularly liberating us from selfish ambition when we make it our life calling to interpret and uh, help fulfill other people's dreams. Wouldn't that be a great life purpose? I just need to tell one more story because I just find it so moving. There was a, um, uh, one of my professors, um, when I was doing my master's degree, his name is Klaus Bachmiel. And if you want to be a professor, you need to be called Bachmiel. That is just the best professor name ever. And he studied under a man named Karl Barth, who is a, one of the most significant theologians of the 20th century. And uh, if you know him, you go, ooh. You know, because he's a, he's a dude in that. So he studied under him, and uh, now Bachmuel is, is uh, teaching me. He's my mentor. And I remember this one time, he, was, he had a group of us in his living room, and we were talking and talking theology, which is always super fun. And then he says to us, and we're just in our mid-20s, we're his students, and he says, there's a, there's a wall in front of the church and uh, uh, I'm not going to be able, I'm not tall enough, I'm not strong enough to climb over that wall. But what I would like to be, and if you pardon my language, I would like to be, and this is his words, a jackass, a donkey. And it would, I'm going to shimmy up to that wall, and it would be my privilege if you would climb on my back and jump over the wall. I'll never make it over, but it would be my honor if you would. Isn't that incredible? He died when I was writing my, uh, my thesis under him. And I've never forgotten those words. This is a man who devoted himself to the success of others. You've never heard his name. But I am forever indebted to somebody who lived that kind of way that would serve a very arrogant 20-something-year-old and uh, care more about our success than his own. This is what Jesus invites us into. And it's a liberating kind of life. Do you know how exhausting it is to try to do self-promotion? It's exhausting. What we all need to do is hire Pastor Mike. And he will do it for us. He'll make us all feel very, very great. <clears throat> the final thing, so we serve our captors, we interpret dreams, other people's dreams, and then we trust in God. So finally, we get to the point in the story where Joseph is now standing before Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, can you interpret my dream? And this is how 
Joseph responds. He says, I cannot do it. Interesting. I thought he could, but I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. This is going to be about God. This is not about me. I don't have special powers. I'm simply a conduit of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's all I'll ever be and all I ever want to be. So uh, how does this fit into the challenges of leadership? What would, be the, what would be the challenge here? And I think a final challenge, at least for me, is the challenge of pressure, of having to be someone great. I don't know if you feel that, but I think God has put inside of all of us a desire to be significant, and that can get perverted. And we want to somehow be someone important. And that sounds beautiful unless, until you start to try to live that out. And then the pressure of, of responsibility is crushing. It's crushing. Simply being a parent. I remember when my son Jonathan, he's now 35. I remember when he was a baby. I was the youngest in my family. I have, I have just no experience with children. And I have 10 of my own. But if you ever bring your kid up, I'll just be awkward. I'm just, I'm horrible around kids. And, I, you know, Jonathan was born. I held him like this, not like this. I just did, had no idea what I was doing. And I felt so much pressure to be amazing. How do we, how do we find freedom from the pressure of having to be an amazing person? How do we get free from the fear of failure? In my city, I would venture to say it's the number one issue for why Christians exclude themselves from having any kind of leadership position in a church. They go, I don't want to fail. I don't want to look bad. And it goes so far as to say, I don't want to have a child. I don't want to fail. How do we find freedom from this final challenge? And the answer is quite simply, powerlessness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says, My grace is sufficient for you. Grace is the empowering presence of God. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Powerlessness clarifies where our faith lies. My faith is not in myself. My faith is in Jesus Christ and his presence. And he is always the hero of the story. I am not the hero of the story. I'll tell you where this really uh, comes true for me. So I have the privilege of meeting with people and listening to their stories and trying to be helpful. Uh, those moments to me are holy moments where people talk about the most vulnerable parts of their lives. It feels like the Holy of Holies to me. It really does. Uh, but uh, let, you know, if, I, if you met with me in one of those moments, I would look like, oh, hmm, and do the counselor thing. You know, oh, tell me more. Um, but inside, let me tell you what's going on inside my head. And so the first thing that goes on is um, you tell me your stories, and I get more and more overwhelmed and discouraged. That's what's going on. So you, you say, you know, I'm having a problem with X. I go, wow, that's difficult. And then you keep talking, and it gets worse and worse. It's like, oh, wow, that's a really hard one. You got a hard problem. You should seek professional help with that problem. And I'm pretty sure I'm not a professional. And I, I get overwhelmed. Now, listen, do you know who I'm thinking about when I'm overwhelmed? Me. And I'm not going to be able to perform well enough for you. And I have a fear of failure. I want to be impressive in the moment. And I make, isn't this horrible? But I make it all about me. And so uh, somebody's telling me their story. And it's getting more and more discouraging for both of us. We're going down this resurrection path together. We're traveling this together. Getting more and more overwhelmed. I'm fully sympathetic to how horrible your life is. I feel your pain. And I am useless right now. This is where we end up. And then, uh, and then something happens inside of me. And almost every time, 
there comes a point when I feel particularly powerless. I think in my head, I'm not going to be very helpful. But what I can do is I can care about them. I can do that. That doesn't require any special talents or anything. I can just care about you. A miracle happens in that moment every time. Because then my focus gets off of me and onto them. And as soon as I lose my self-consciousness and not thinking about my performance and think about them, my anxiety goes down and God speaks to me. Ask this question. Say this. Pray this. And now I'm cooperating with the Holy Spirit and ministering this person because I've become self-forgetful. There's no way for me to get to a place of dependency upon God without walking through the valley of powerlessness. So let's conclude. It's fascinating that in this story, the cupbearer forgets Joseph, but God did not. And the truth is that when we're in a valley, God is not forgetting us. He's purifying us. Can you please believe that? When you're in a valley, it's not God. Where are you? Is, is the, and what is our primary agenda when we're in valleys? To gather them. <laughs> That's all I'm ever thinking about. And it's, by the way, what Joseph was thinking about as well. Thank God it's not all that he was thinking about. But we all just want to get out of the valley as quickly as possible. And it's true that we're not meant to live there. But what if there were things that God wants to do in us that can only be done in valleys? And if we were to circumnavigate those valleys, if we were to ignore them or in the name of a triumphant Jesus, try to jump over them, that we would miss the ministry of God to us to deliver us from our pride, our selfish ambition and our fear of failure so that we can move into a destiny that is about glorifying God and loving others genuinely for their benefit and not our own. So here's what's true about our Kidron Valleys, about our prisons or pits, however you'd like to call it. God is answering our prayers. I mean, I mean, can you answer it another way? I mean, it's the first thing that goes to my mind. But anyways, uh, no, he can't. This is the way that God moves us into a meaningful life. It's through the valley. And so uh, my encouragement to us today is can we please receive our valleys? Not as punishment, not because you're doing something wrong, actually because you're probably doing something right. And God is wanting to equip you to move into the next dimension of what he has in store for your life. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for being kind to us. We've seen so many leaders fall. And you are trying to spare us, not just from hurting ourselves, but from hurting so many. And so we receive the injustice the misunderstanding. We receive these things as gifts to deliver us from evil. And so, Father, I ask that you would give us the grace to not rise up in these moments, but to humble ourselves, to be defined by you, and to be liberated, to be ministers of your gospel. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise, eh? So we, uh, we get the opportunity to respond to the preaching of the word. Every Sunday, our prayer is that God would speak to you. And that you would change by repenting 
any wrong way of thinking. And that's what repenting is. Repenting is, is a change of mind. It's a change of direction of the way you were thinking. And we believe that before Christ returns, that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. You know, when I was a young believer, I, I thought the glory of the Lord was that would cover the earth was kind of like a, a, a it was a snow glow or uh, uh, like a snow glow, like you shake it up and you know it's like this fairy dust or would cover the earth. That's not God's glory. It's most glorified through lives He changes. We are the the prize of creation. He created us in his image. And so as people come to Jesus, more of God's glory fills the earth. But as we grow in Jesus, more of his glory goes with us. And so we come in one way. We encounter the presence of God. We encounter the word of God, which is the incorruptible seed that gets in us. And the word that has already been in us gets watered. And he causes it to grow. Yes, in a moment that you believe the word, transformation can happen in your life. So you walk in one way and you walk out another way. See, what an unbelieving, dying, even non-believing in God world thinks is just unbelievable is Christians who come to church and then they leave church and they confess Jesus has transformed their lives, but they look at them and go, I don't see any transformation. See, the glory of God is as we become like him, being made in his image, amen? Amen. And so you hear a message like this and you could go, oh, that was amazing. And, and your ears can be tickled and your, and your mind can be wowed. And you can have this mental ascent of these truths and go, that was so good. Yet, if that so good doesn't go 18 inches down into your heart, it does no good. It was so good, but did no good. Because you didn't believe it and receive it and let it transform you. I had the privilege of hearing that message twice. And it's never the same. It's always different because it's a different crowd of people that God is ministering to. But there's things that I know I've taken become more like Christ. You know, sometimes it's easy to love strangers, enemies. But what about when that person you love does something that makes you in that moment feel like they're your enemy? Any of you that have been married longer than a week. <laughs> know what I'm talking about. The one that you love, and all of a sudden, in that moment, they're like, they're your enemy. They're not your enemy, but they feel like it. But how are we any different than anybody else if we can't love? in the moments we don't feel loved, especially those that we really love and they love us. And so nobody has been used more in my life to make me like Jesus than my wife. Nobody. Our spouses sometimes are like sandpaper.
that God is using to make us smooth. So how is the Holy Spirit speaking to you today? What are you going to believe and receive and be transformed with? Don't walk out of here the same. If you do, you really have not gotten the most value out of what you could have. I'm not, I wasn't going to say you wasted your time because it's still better than what you could be doing. But get everything out of this moment. Encounter Jesus in his presence. Be changed so that you can bring more glory to his name as you leave this place. So we're going we're gonna to stand together. We got some baptisms we're going to do here, but we're going to sing first because I want you to respond to the message and I want to fill this place for this moment of baptism with God's manifested presence. Amen? So would you bow your heads for a moment? What has the Holy Spirit been speaking to you through this message and even in this moment? What is he saying to you? What do you need to repent of, change the way you've thought of towards somebody, about a situation? Maybe there's a valley you've avoided Today, you're going to say yes to Jesus and walk through it. Maybe it's that unknown of going to somebody that the relationship is not right. To reconcile with them, not knowing how they'll respond. That could be a valley that he's calling you to humble yourself, to, to step into an unknown where there's all kinds of fears and doubts. Maybe it's a valley of going to repent to somebody for something you've done. Maybe it's a valley where there's all kinds of risks that God's saying, I'm calling you to do this. However, the Holy Spirit's speaking, just say yes. Just say yes. The grace to say yes is here today. Let's worship in this moment. Let's respond in worship.
to the cross for us, for dying the death that we deserve to die. But you went in our place. And Lord, as we celebrate the lives that you've changed in baptism today, Lord, I thank you that it represents the burial and the resurrection. And Lord, we thank you that you're gonna bury old lives. You're gonna bury pain and regret and shame today. And Lord, people are gonna come out of the water with newness of life. And Lord, that this will be a, a moment they, they will remember for the rest of their lives that God, that they are saved, that they, they have a home that's being prepared for them in heaven. And God, let it remind us today of what took place when, when we gave our lives to you, when we were baptized. Thank you, Jesus. All right, Pastor Cruz, who do we have? Let's do this. Okay, who's first? Jacob, give it up for Jacob. Come on. Jacob, man of God, tell us why you want to get baptized today. Um, today I'm getting baptized because I owe my life to God. Um, I wouldn't be here without him, and I wouldn't be the man I am before all of you. And I just give, I just owe it to him. Hey Amen. Come on. Somebody hold that mic for Pastor Cruz. Let's do this. Is, is Jesus the Lord of your life? He is. Jesus is the Lord of my life. Is he your savior? Is my savior. Based on your confession, your own confession of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's my honor and privilege now to baptize you. This is mom following her son. Come on. We love it. Oof. Diana, why do you want to get baptized today and what are you believing for? Um, I'm getting baptized today just to grow my relationship with the Lord and to bring my brothers and sisters closer to God. Amen. Is Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes, he is. Are you ready to follow him today in baptism? Yes, I am. Amen. Based on your own confession of faith, it is my honor now to baptize you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, we've got a young man named Christian. Come on. Give it up for Christian. Christian, why do you want to get baptized today, and what are you believing for? Uh, I just want to get closer to God, because when I was younger, my parents like kind of made me do it, but I just want to do it on my own. Hallelujah. Right, let's go. Is Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, Christian? Yes. Based on your own confession, it is my honor today to baptize you in the name of the Father. Glory to God, yes! Amen. All right, all right, Marissa. Let's do a skip it up for Marissa. Marissa, why do you want to get baptized today, and what are you believing for? I want to get baptized today because God is good, and I wouldn't be here without Him. And I want to spread love and kindness, and 
to restore my marriage. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Is Come Jesus, on, Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes, he is. Are you ready to follow him in baptism today? Yes, I am. Based on your own confession of Jesus as Lord and Savior, now it is my honor to baptize you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Woo. All right. Well, we've got McKenna. Give it up for McKenna. So as McKenna is getting ready to be baptized, for some of you who see Pastor Cruz grab the microphone in the tub, understand it's not wired. So if it falls in, we just lose the microphone. We don't lose people. They're, okay. Um, so Spirit it's totally is. safe. It's totally safe. Okay. So <laughs> just want to relieve any anxiety in the room. All right. So go ahead, Pastor Cruz. McKenna. Uh, are you ready to get baptized today? And what are you believing for? Um, I grew up in a kind of religious checklist, but God's done a lot of healing and faith has never been my own, but today faith is gonna be my own. Come on. Is Jesus Christ the Lord and savior of your life? Yes. Are you ready to follow him in baptism? Yes. By your own confession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and savior, it is my honor now to baptize you. Yes! Hallelujah! All right. Well, we've got Treasure. Come on, Treasure's getting baptized next. treasure. God sees you as his treasure. You're the apple of his eye. And this season is going to mark a season of great joy and boldness. Joy and boldness. Are you ready to be baptized today? And, and what are you believing for, treasure? I'm ready for the Lord to be the true Lord of my life every day. So Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. Yes. Are you ready to follow him and to baptism today. Amen. Based on your own confession of Jesus as both Lord and Savior of your life, it is my honor now to baptize you. We'll give it up for Shane and Geraldine. They're getting they're getting baptized next, but one at a time. So, so we always we always encourage uh, those that are walking with people and friends, or those discipling, those getting baptized, to join um, with that process in the Bible. Uh, the qualification to baptize somebody is to be a disciple. You don't need a pastor to do it. So we encourage you to, uh, to do the same. So go ahead. Geraldine, are you ready to be baptized? And what are you believing for? I want to stop hiding my faith and finally rededicate my life to the Lord. Is Jesus Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Are you ready to follow him? By your own declaration of faith, Geraldine, based on your own confession of Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Now, now her husband, Shane, come on, give it up. Shane.
Shane, you ready to be baptized this morning? And what do you believe for? I spent 31 years not knowing Christ, and I'm not wasting another minute, and I hope to serve him. I'm going to surrender everything to him. Jesus is Lord and Savior, and it is, I will live the rest of my life to serve him. Amen. You said it. Let it be in the name of Jesus. Are you ready to follow him? Absolutely. By your own faith declaration that Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life, it is my honor to baptize you, brother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah! All right. Well, we've got Ben, our last one today. Come on, give it up for Ben! Microphone. Ben, you ready to get baptized? Is it still morning or this afternoon? It's afternoon. Are you ready to get baptized this afternoon? Absolutely. What are you believing for, Ben? I'm rededicating my life to Jesus. Because I spent, uh, I spent quite some time making a choice uh, to be away from him. So that's why I'm rededicating my life today. Is Jesus both Lord and Savior of your life, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. Are you ready to follow him in baptism? Yes, I am. Based on your own confession on. of faith as Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, it is my honor now to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. Yeah, give a shout, Jesus! 